This morning we share from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, beginning with the 28th verse. Hear these words of Mark, referring to the Gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that, he answered them well. He asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. For this season of Lent, we've started our journey together of seeking some faith questions. And as seekers of faith, uh, we can do that either as an established Christian uh, um, um, uh, relationship that we have, or we can do it from the place of just wanting to begin that relationship from anywhere outside our circle. And the hope is is that these questions and as we seek the answers through the understanding of Scripture and conversation and the Spirit of God abiding, that we find ourselves moving closer to a deeper faith that will help us understand even more concisely the gift of sacrifice that we see on the cross and the power that is given for us in life everlasting. The truth is, um, we'd like Easter to mean something when we get there. And to get there, maybe answering these questions grows us in our faith. Last week, our faith question was, who is Jesus? And I pray that maybe the conversation that we had in worship has led to some inspiration about your life where in the course of the week, you have been finding more answers for yourselves regarding that question, who is Jesus for you? What is your relationship? What is your understanding? What is your connection with the the person Jesus, but also the Lord Jesus? Today we walk into Matthew, I mean to Mark, and we see this understanding of another question that's surfacing in the community. And the question, if we could put it in a contemporary form, would be something like this. What matters most? What matters most? I mean, we get overwhelmed sometimes with these rules and these lists of things that we're supposed to do as Christian people or as people who just want to please and satisfy God or simply just to become a person that we qualify as good and living a good life. How do we get there? And how do I decide what really matters most? It's a question of priority at some level. And the question for us today might be, what matters most? What is your passion? What is the one thing that you seek for and live for? And the way I demonstrated it with the children was if you had that extra hour to do anything you wanted to do, what would you do with that hour besides sleep? I used to visit with children as part of an evaluation process I did with counseling um, where I'd go in from the, for the schools and I'd be doing a, um, a, a process of getting to know the children. And one of the questions I'd often would ask them, if you had a whole day to do whatever you wanted to do, what would you do with it, you know? Um, just to see what their passions were, to learn a little bit about what they really cared about. It was very interesting sometimes the questions you would hear. I think if I ask that among adults sometimes, the question might, the answer might quickly be sleep, right? Uh, Rest. Because we all know that these are the things that we really want, but we don't make the time for. 
When Jesus is here in this passage answering the question, he's giving a guiding direction for those of us who are people of faith that want to know more, this relationship with God. How do we grow it? How do we nurture it? And we have to decide what are the priorities. We have to decide what matters most. Church attendance, reading the scriptures, worship, prayer, what matters most? Well, I love the way this passage begins. You caught this, didn't you? Verse 28, one of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. He walks into a religious conversation, and guess what they're doing? They're disagreeing. I know it's foreign to all of us, isn't it? We don't see that in the church anymore, do we? John Wesley would try to condition it for us a little bit and say, oh, it's just holy conversation. But we are a people that sometimes get caught. And the image of someone who walks into our midst is that we're a people who are unhappy because we can't agree. And the sad part is, is the truth to that would be that sometimes when we don't agree, it becomes very difficult for us to even relate to one another. We draw lines, and our disputes become more an established uh, uh, division between us than a place to grow. We learn in our personal relationships sometimes that a disagreement doesn't mean you throw away the whole relationship. I sit down with couples before their marriage and their wedding and everything, and we have that discussion. Here's how you fight. Here's how you can fight and fight well. I'm not going to tell you you can't fight. I'm not going to tell you that you don't need to fight because you do. You need to disagree some. You need to have conflict. You, need to ha- you don't run from it. You prepare for it and you make it work so that you can grow the relationship. The church needs to know that, to not be afraid of the conflict, but to grow in it. And I think here when we see this person coming in and seeing them in dispute, uh, the note here is that so things are very much what they normally are. Being in a disagreement is how we grow in our understanding. That's what John Wesley wanted in Holy Conversation, a chance to still respect each other, but have a conversation that leads us to the new understanding that we all need. And so as was common... The men are gathered at the gates, they're having their conversations, they're discussing the laws of God. And I'm sure there was a conversation going back and forth about who had the real better understanding and which rules were the most important. By the way, by this point we've taken 10 commandments and we've created over 700 laws that you're supposed to obey, every one of them being a priority, which makes it a little difficult for some people. I don't know about you, but I'm not a rebel, I wouldn't say, but keeping up with just a few laws in my life sometimes can be overwhelming. 700 religious laws so that I can be right with God? Down to where how I treat animals, what I eat, how I cook it, how I prepare it, how I clean it, what I do on the Sabbath, how I define the Sabbath. Rules for everything. So perhaps it was a pointed moment when the scribe who's coming, and and by the way, the scribes are, are, they're the ones that keep the record, right? They're the ones that write things down. What are they doing talking? So the scribe's stepping outside of his comfort zone here, and he's asking a question. But note the condition in which he's doing it. He says, seeing that he answered them well. So the scribe is keeping record of the conversation, and he notes how Jesus' answers seem to answer the question and take him a little bit further. He's picking up on the fact that this is not just your typical teacher, rabbi here. This is, this is good stuff. Maybe now's the time to ask the really good question that I've been wondering. Are you bold enough today to ask God the real questions? 
the real questions of your heart? Are you bold enough to do that? Are you bold enough this morning to simply say to God, God, I need to know what matters most? What matters the most for me? Some of us are still waiting for that opportunity when it's right before us. And so the scribe takes the moment and he simply asks, which commandment is the first of all? I know there's a list. I got it. I write them down all the time. I'm keeping records. But Jesus, just tell us what's the most important. If I have a limited ability, tell me where my priority needs to be. And I don't know about you, but There are days when we walk in this Christian life and there are days when we walk just in life itself that we struggle with, where do I start? What's the most important part of this day going to be? What's the most important part of what I can do and how I can make a difference in my life or in my world or in my family or in this place that I worship? How do I really make it matter? Well, first of all, you've got to care what people think. You've got to care what kind of influence you are. You've got to care about the purpose behind what you do. You don't just go through the motions. You don't do it because everybody else is doing it. You do it because you suddenly realize how important it is. I mean, I could stand here all day and tell you how important Scripture reading is, how important it is to be into the Word of God, how significant it would be for you to have some understanding based on Scripture to get through life itself. And that won't make a difference until you own it, until you find that place where you go, you know what, this Scripture is something that's going to make a significant difference. It becomes a priority for you. You can't read it because the preacher told you to or your Sunday school teacher told you to, or because you're afraid that someone's going to ask you a question and you won't have an answer. You have to read it because it has a message for you. I'll confess something here. The trap for pastors is that you start reading Scripture for what you're going to preach. You're going over the Scriptures and you're saying to yourself, that'll preach, that'll preach, oh, that'll make it, this'll be, this'll be good, And you look and you search Scripture just for what you're going to preach on. The harder part is sitting down and opening up your Bible and letting the Bible just speak to you whatever it wants to say. I um, I had the fortune of attending uh, the Gideon's dinner this week with uh, Mr. Bowie, and there was a testimony there about the power and impact of Scripture. And... um, it didn't, it didn't say, uh, he didn't say, God led me to this or God made me. Instead, it was just, my, I opened my Bible and the Word spoke to me. Too often we have our agendas and we're not open to what God's agenda is. But my point was, is that Scripture becomes a priority when you make it a priority. Worship becomes a priority when you make it a priority. And when Jesus has asked this question, I'm sure the scribe is speaking for a lot of people in the community at this point, a lot of people in that circle, people that he's known, and maybe perhaps all of the understanding of religious order at this point. Help us. We're, we're burying ourselves in laws and rules, and we just got to know, where do I start? What's the most important? What matters the most? And hear Jesus' answer. The first is, and then he quotes, by the way, Scripture. He doesn't, he doesn't put it in his own words. He gives them their word, the words of the Holy Scriptures right back to them. The first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. There's your priority. That's what matters the most, loving God. It's kind of neat here to think about it because it's a nice way of making it very simple. What matters most? Loving God. By the way, that's with all your heart, all your mind, 
on your soul and your strength. It can sound very simple, and at the same time, it can be overwhelmingly challenging. The phrase that we hear is that the pathway is paved with good intentions. How do you really do this? Then Jesus goes so far as to now offer a second. In other words, okay, you want to know what matters the most. Guess what? It's connected. You can't just separate one out. There's a flow. There's a path of connection for all of these. And here's the two that I want to give you. The first is love your God. The second, he says, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then he says, there is no other commandment. You notice he's going singular here. There is no other commandment greater than these. What I want us to hear at this point is that he has now brought those two together. You can't really love your neighbor without loving God. You can be good. You can be kind. You can be courteous. You can be polite. You can do favors. But really love, genuinely love, is born from a love of God. And the contrast to that is that I really can't love my God if I can't love the neighbor, the person that he's given everything for the same as me. I can't understand my own salvation unless I understand the power of salvation for my neighbor. I can't understand the the need of forgiveness in my life until I understand the need of forgiveness in my neighbor. The whole pattern and relationship here is a mesh. Love the Lord your God is the first. If you want to know what matters most, that's it. That's the goal. That's what we're all made for. That's what we strive for. That's where we need to be. If we're going to be obedient to God, we've got to love God. He has to be your priority. Kind of sounds like, um, I I am the Lord my God, the Lord your God. There will be no other gods before me. Familiar, isn't it? But Jesus is saying, love the Lord your God. And then love your neighbor as yourself. It's this pattern of the two becoming one no other commandment you see you got the same in both very simple yet not so easy I know I I I go through my day and I get up and I set my goal of trying to make the priority going to be today love God love my neighbor and in the course of the day I find myself on a pathway sometimes that pull me this way and that way and the challenge becomes set more and more it's an ongoing process there's no simply got that check it off my list if you're going to commit to love God you're committing to a lifelong commitment If you're going to commit to really loving your neighbor, you're committing to a lifelong commitment. It's not something you do today and then turn it off on Wednesday when you're tired. It's not like a t-shirt you put on and then take off when you get home. It's not something that you can put on like a, a cross necklace and then take off whenever you want to go somewhere else and not be known as a Christian. It's one of those things that becomes a part of who you are. Maybe the challenge today is for us to be bold enough to not only ask the question, but to embrace the real answer to our question. You remember earlier I was asking you, are you bold enough today to ask that question to God? What matters the most? Be prepared. His answer will be just as bold But it's a place to start. It's a goal and a guide for us who seek to become stronger in our faith or maybe to begin a faith. That today we could put God as the priority. And in that same spirit, 
remember the same passion he had for our neighbors. The way this passage closes as if he needed the affirmation verse 20, 32 then the scribe said to him you are right teacher yeah really <laughs> you are right teacher you have truly said that he is one in other words there's no other god that's the god and besides him there is no other and to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself he's just given the summary it's as if the scribe is doing exactly what a scribe does he puts it down he puts it i got it it's all and he actually here puts it all in one statement not in two statements but he captures that commandment thing that you have one commandment in both of these and then he says, and this is his own reflection, by the way. This is much more important than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Which when you go back and look at that 700-something laws that's in there, what you discover is that there was so much breakdown and emphasis on how we repair our relationship with God all those burnt offerings, all those things and rules about what you had to do under this circumstance or that circumstance, the scribe is already capturing for us that if you just love God and love your neighbor, there's not an offering of yourself that can be any greater. God couldn't be more pleased. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Oh, um, I don't know about you, but I look forward to the day that I could hear something like that. I mean, not that I want to brag or anything. Not that I want to, you know, pat on the back for being faithful to God and faithful to my neighbor. But what a joy it would be to know that the kingdom is within reach. A lot of us have made some travels and We've driven some distances and we've looked for those landmarks that will tell us we're getting there, haven't we? I can remember coming uh, one time with a youth group. We had took 30 youth and adults uh, from Tyler all the way to Pasadena, California, driving in vans. Insanity, okay? Um, and we were trying to get home. <laughs> um, and it had been a long trip and a long journey, and we were tired. And I can remember in the evening as I'm driving and everybody's asleep in the van, you know. As we came through New Mexico, I could see the lights of Albuquerque in the distance. And it was just for, some, for me, I knew we were going to spend the night there. So it's part of me kind of going, oh, oh I'm, it's there. I can get there now. I can get there now. I didn't realize how far Albuquerque was still was at that point. And, you know, I mean, East Texas. If you can see the lights, it's in the next few miles, right? But this was Albuquerque. I mean, it was like forever still getting there. But I kept looking to those lights, looking to those lights, and looking to those lights. You're not far from the kingdom of God. Sometimes when we can find that place where we're bold enough to ask the question, what matters most? And we're bold enough to hear and establish that answer that God wants to hand back to us in that. There may be that moment when loving God and loving my neighbor lets me know we're going to get there from here. And it's within reach. Let me encourage you today to hear this passage, to read it this week, to review it and think about it, reflect on it, and sort in your life the ways that you can make this the answer of your question of faith. <coughs> How in this course of the week, as Christian people, as those who seek God's answers, can we grow in the ways and the means of God's grace that will make life matter? We do it by loving God, and loving our neighbors. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.